would you turn with me to the Gospel of Mark? Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, choir and ministers of music. So glad for you today and for your ministry. Hallelujah. You really, really were used of the Lord, and I appreciate a choir, a minister of music that will prepare him herself for the will of God to be done through them. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I thank you all for, for standing out of respect for the word of God. But I've got a lengthy portion of scripture to read in your hearing, so I'm going to uh, let you be seated if you wouldn't mind. Praise God. Thank you for standing. Hallelujah. Uh, I didn't say that at the first because I wanted to see who all would stand. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, this being the latter days, you'd be surprised how many churches where they don't stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to go there. We'll just, we'll just leave that alone for right now. And I'm well aware of the, the weekend that we are in, this being the weekend after, uh, as our calendar keeps it, the weekend after the death and the burial and the resurrection. Jesus would be in our calendar keeping somewhere along the shores of Galilee with his disciples because he was seen some 40 days 50 days after, 40 days, excuse me, after uh, his resurrection. Um, but we are going to go back in our reading this afternoon to the Feast of Passover, the last Feast of Passover that the Lord celebrated with his disciples. Uh, it has been weighing heavily on me these last couple, three weeks, and uh, if you'll just allow me to obey the Lord and give you what he's put in my heart. How many of you really do still want to hear from God? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 14 and verse number one. Uh, bear with our, our media men. We're going to possibly skip around a little bit as we, as we read, but verse number one says, after two days, was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft, my Bible in the margin says trickery, and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, and oh, we could preach a little while on that. How can you be a Pharisee with leprosy? As he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now, some of you may be aware that they didn't sit like we are sitting in upright chairs in front of a table. They actually lounged or reclined, if you would, laying forward on a couch on their left side so that they could reach with their right hand to the table. and. Often at banquets, it was a U-shaped table so that everyone could be closer together. Indeed, that's exactly the way it was at the Last Supper. It wasn't as we often see pictured, a long, straight, upright table with Jesus sitting in the middle. It was a U-shaped table with Jesus sitting right at the head of the U. But here this woman comes into this all-male gathering, these religious and notable men, and she comes right up to where Jesus is 
lounging and breaks open this vial of alabaster and pours out a fragrance that instantly everyone recognizes, spikenard, very precious, very costly, and she anoints his head with this ointment. Verse number four, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, we know at least one said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. Hallelujah. And they murmured, they criticized against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work. She has wrought a beautiful deed, my Bible says in the margin, on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you may do them good. But me you have not always. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And we're going to keep reading, but I want you to lift your heart to the Lord and ask him to insert you in this last week of the Lord's life. As we continue reading, would you do that with me right now? Father, in Jesus' name, put us in the scene. Let us all experience in the Holy Ghost a you are there moment as we read and visualize this setting and move forward with the disciples. Let us go with them. Let us partake with them. And everybody said in Jesus' name, hallelujah. Verse number 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. My, 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 one of the twelve. Something Machiavellian going on here in the mind of Judas. Something of desire and frustration going on in the heartbeat of this man, scheming and crafting the way that he was, it not happening fast enough. Can I say it like that? So he went to try to speed things up. Knowing what he had been hearing, that the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were tired of Jesus. They saw the end of their dynasty coming. And Judas realized, this is a chance for me to make some money. This is a chance for me to come down on the right side of these current event happenings. Verse number 12. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? Oh, brothers and sisters, we're about to read a miracle. We are about to read a miracle. I, I want to say at this time, too, that what we are reading is the writing of John Mark, who is writing what Peter dictated to him. And so you can imagine Peter being the man of action that he was and of, of boldly stepping forward. His account of things may leave a little bit to be desired, 
But the things that he does remember and the things that he does record, they are, if we will allow the Spirit to use him, they are very impactful for us and for where the Bible church is right now. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, Pastor Julian, the Lord desires fruit from this church. The Lord is looking for the flowing of the sweet fragrance of spikenard in our midst and through our ministries. Somebody say hallelujah. Verse number 13. And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, they're asking, where do you want us to go prepare? We don't have any arrangements. We don't know anybody. We, we have nothing set up. Where do you want us to go? And he says, go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. Now, that's not really a big deal. This great feast day, uh, there should be numerous women everywhere carrying pitchers of water. It was indeed women's work. Men didn't carry water. But Jesus said, look for a man carrying a pitcher of water. And, and when you see him, follow him. Verse 14, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, say ye to the owner of the home, the master, the rabbi hath, saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And in the evening, he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him, One by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? Here we are, brothers and sisters, the last week of the Lord's life in the flesh here on the earth. And he is outside at the beginning here of the Jerusalem environs, having a dinner in a Pharisee's home, ostensibly because he wanted an audience with Jesus. And also because Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. And this most notable miracle was such everybody in the area who knew Lazarus, Mary and Martha, he was something beloved of them, had died, been dead for three days, four days. By now he stinketh. But Jesus called him forth. And people on their way to the great feast, the general conference of their day, if you please, the Passover, they stopped by to see Lazarus raised from the dead. And, of course, to see Jesus, this one that raised him from the dead. And this woman, having broken in on their feasting and fellowship, because in her heart she said, I'm going to do it. I've got to do it. And she broke open that vial. You know the story. And she poured it on Jesus' head, anointing him. And they were all these men indignant. Ladies, you understand. You've got money hidden and squirreled away in so many places. Who knows how many dollars you've really got hiding in the corners of your purse and in coffee cups in the back of the cabinet and other places that your husband doesn't know about. Your, your emergency mad money, so to speak. Hallelujah. But here's this woman 
who poured out a vial of wondrous perfume worth a year's wage for a working man. Judas accurately calculated the price and was leading the charge and admonishing what a waste it was. Let her alone, Jesus said. She's working a good work on me. She's come actually beforehand to anoint my body for the burying. Of all of you here, she's the only one that truly seems to understand, that truly has gotten it. Three times Jesus spoke to his disciples concerning his death and his burial. And she's the only one that seemed to really get it. And now, knowing, because she's seen the billboards and the signs everywhere, Anybody know where Jesus is? Call 1-800-THE-TEMPLE-COLLECT. We want to come and get him. We want to do away with him. She knew what was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. And now she decided, I'm going to do it. I am going. It's the end time. It's the end time. It's the end time. And they're going to take him. There's going to be a confrontation. And they're going to kill him. And we're not going to have time to show our appreciation and to bury and anoint him properly. Jesus said so. She's come beforehand to anoint my body. She's come to do what she can. What she can. And in our 20th century way of thinking, we'll often read that she's doing what she could as if she's just doing what's mediocre and enough to get by. But the reality is she was doing the very best that she could. Hallelujah, glory to God. Because of the end time, because of the worthiness of the Lamb that was about to be slain for the sins of the world, because it was her Lord and her Savior, the one that had raised her brother, she was going to give and offering the very best that she could, that she had to give. I wonder how many of us really give the best that we can when it comes to worshiping and to praising the Lord and to blessing Him. I wonder how many of us that are sensitive this afternoon to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God is in this place and has been dealing with us. He is well aware of our infirmities. He is well aware of our situations. He has come to minister to us. I wonder how many of us had come to minister to Him or just to receive a blessing as He he touched us. I wonder how many of us here in the Bible church are really willing to do what we can in this end time hour because the Lord is about to return. Clap your hands and praise him. Clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Somebody open your mouth and say I love you Jesus. Can you imagine the way that it came across? Number one, a woman being in that solemn assembly. Number two, that woman having broken an offering and poured it out on Jesus that none of those men sitting there could match. Number three, Jesus talking to them about the nearness. Hallelujah. The end time and the crunch that he was under by relating to them how that she has come to do what she could. Hallelujah. He was letting them know the pressure, the pressure. It was getting to him, and it should be getting to them. But apparently Mary is the only one that really recognized it, that really understood. I wonder how many of us here this afternoon really recognize that these are the last days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, if we're not careful, we will let our culture and our society, which is 
pell-mell moving forward, four or five lanes of traffic going every direction. We will, if we're not careful, be caught up in life and the fastness of the pace here in Indianapolis. And I promise you, being from Arizona and spending a great deal of time on their freeways and in California, it is like driving in a funeral procession here. You gotta be doing 80 to 85 miles an hour to get on the freeway where I'm from, hallelujah. It is some 40 to 45, maybe even 50 degrees below what you are feeling or above what you are feeling here you're like 40 below compared to where i'm from it's 80 something amen and it's what 50 60 something here praise god hallelujah glory to god what am i trying to tell you that it is the end time and we if we're not careful we will slouch off the pressure we will forget all about where we are heading and the need to give ourselves wholeheartedly, fully to the release of Spikenard as worship unto the Lord our God. Would you lift your hands and love him with me right now? Would you lift your voice and say, Jesus? Would you say that name like you really love it, like it really means something to you? Jesus. 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 Oh, Lord Jesus. His Talmudim traveling with him only know they are headed to Jerusalem to share a third Passover with their rabbi, with the master, with their Lord and their Savior. And with no place to go, with no place to sit down and eat together, because we're not told how Jesus knew, hallelujah, but he being the Lord God, we can write it off like that, praise God, hallelujah. But imagine, there is a man somewhere in the city who's already been dealt with, who's already got an upper room prepared with food and table and fixings we don't know how he was dealt with maybe it was a dream and they find him by following wonder of wonders a man carrying a pitcher of water they literally ran into him by the way the scripture reads and they followed him home and asked him where the guest chamber was. And it was all just like Jesus described to them. They show up that evening, still not really by the scriptures we see, comprehending the pressure, the pressure, what he is feeling. Hallelujah. And as they are sitting there, eating this last supper, he drops the bomb the 800-pound gorilla that nobody could see in the spirit. He drops it, exposing it. Somebody here is going to betray me. Imagine you're in that setting. You're there waiting and preparing to eat with the rest of them. And all of a sudden, you hear the words of your Lord. Somebody here is going to betray me. Which one of you? Which is it you, Matthew? Is it you, Bartholomew? Peter. I know it's Peter. Big talk. He's the one. And then they realize who just told them that one of them is going to betray him. And so they ask the question humbly, sincerely, fearfully, Lord. Is it me? You're the only one that knows everything about everything, about every one of us. Is it me, Lord? Am I the one? Am I going to betray you? Look at verse number 20. And he answered, again, remember, this is Peter's recollect. I hope you realize this, praise God. 
that these four gospels, they're like four witnesses at an accident. They all saw the same thing, but they saw it from four different angles. So they all see and remember four different accentuated things. And this is Peter's recollection written by Mark. Peter's writing, he says in verse 20, Jesus answered and said unto them, It is the one, it is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. Hallelujah. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good word for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave to them. They each got a piece. And he said, take, eat this. It is my body. And we could preach a little while about that brokenness of his body for you and I, for our deliverance for our salvation and he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank of it one cup they all partook they all partook of his blood being shared poured out This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will not, hallelujah, drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung and him they went out into the Mount of Olives and Jesus saith unto them oh hold on brother sister Jesus saith unto them all ye every one of you shall be offended you're going to be caused to stumble I don't want you to look around but he's talking to you. Each one of us, because of Jesus, is going to be caused to stumble. Oh, my God. The King James says, all of you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written in Zechariah, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And after that, I am risen. I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Anybody here ever made that brash and bold statement like Peter? Hearing the preaching, some point being manifest in the word, and it impacts you, oh no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be like that. I know, brother, sister, so-and-so might not, but I'm going to be all right. I'm going to make it. I'm not going to stumble. I'm going to hold it together. Verse 30, and Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee that this day, even tonight, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Before the cock the rooster crows twice. You're going to deny me three times, Peter. But he spoke the more vehemently. I should die with thee. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise, they all said the same thing. They all said the same thing. There's not a one of us here that has said, I don't want to make it. I intend to make it. I am not going to stumble. 
and lose out with God. By the grace of God, I'm going to make it. Jesus, just let them say on. Let's love the Lord again right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to try to hurry, I promise you. The Lord wants to deal with you personally here in the next few minutes. And they came to the place, verse 32, which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him, do you hear me, saint? And he taketh with him Peter, James, and John. And began to be amazed and to be very heavy. Lord, Lord. He began to be very stirred and upset in his spirit, having taken with him Peter, James, and John. All of you, you, you nine, I want you to wait here. Peter, James, John, you three come with me. And he let them know particularly how he was feeling. I wonder who is our Peter, James, and John in the Bible church today. I wonder which one of you are set apart from the rest of the disciples by your love and your desire for Jesus. You're willing to offer spikenard from your alabaster boxes if you had it. I wonder which one of us has truly let the Lord deal with us is it me? Is there something about me? Can I just be really blunt? What's holding my ministry back, Lord? What is it that you see in me that's keeping me from being the woman of God that you desire, the man of God that you want me to be? What is it about me, Lord? I, I, I won't be offended. But what is it about me, Lord? Somebody say, Jesus. Peter, James, and John come with him into the garden. Verse number 34. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. He brings them. Verse 35, he brings them a little farther. And then he himself, verse 35, went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. The Spirit of the Lord dealt with me reading this. There are several times when the Lord said, beginning at the turning of water into wine, when his mother wanted him to intercede in that wedding and do something, Jesus said, woman, what have I to do with thee? He wasn't being disrespectful. He was honoring her. But he said, my hour is not yet. It's not my time. He said that a few times in the scripture, implying it, that his hour was coming, and now this is his hour, and he is praying, Father, let my hour pass. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Verse number 36, hallelujah. Well, verse 35, excuse me. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. I wonder if there's anybody here 
that can honestly pray with that kind of valiant desire for God. Father, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup. I don't want to endure what's coming in this hour. I don't want to go through what I've got to go through to fulfill my ministry. Oh, can't you just take me to heaven? Can't you just rapture me now? Do I have to go? Here we go. Do I have to go through my sufferings? Do I have to go through my infirmities? Do I have to endure my sicknesses? Do I have to be deprived and even be alone? Am I coming to the altar crying for your healing and your deliverance? And not seeing it? Because your suffering, your sickness... Your situation, it is working for you a far greater weight of glory and blessing. Hallelujah. My brother and sister, I heard a preacher say, I've been pondering it for some time now. He said, everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die to get there. But we're not ready to go as we are. Yes, we've been baptized in water filled with the Spirit sanctified by the blood, hallelujah, enjoying the blessing of the Holy But you've got to die in order to fulfill your ministry. You've got to die to be the kind of Christian that God wants. You see, Jesus was so impressed with Mary and the breaking of that alabaster box because he knew it was in perfect type and shadow what was going to happen to him. He was going to be broken. By the suffering he endured on the cross. And in the breaking, that precious God blood was going to flow out of his veins. And it was going to leak down the cross and onto the ground. And that would be the purchasing of the redeemed possession of mankind and all of his children. But it had to be that that alabaster box, his flesh, be broken. So that the spike knot could flow forth. I wonder how many of you are really willing to be broken. Because it's still going to take that kind of sacrifice for us to become the apostolic anointed men and women that God wants us to be. I thought pastor was going to step all over my message here. And the word that the Lord gave me, he indeed led right up to the door. Hallelujah. Telling you that your suffering and the things that you endure and the situation that you go through, you've got to go through it. You've got to pray through it. You've got to endure so that you come out on the other other side because you see no one is transformed by blessing no one is transformed by good times no one is changed by party and fellowshipping in joyful dance before the Lord you are transformed by your pain you are transformed by your suffering you are changed by the things that you endure that cause you to become the vessel that God wants you to become and to leak out what he's put inside of you because it is only by the flow of the spirit that is released through the breaking of your alabaster the spike nard of the Holy Ghost that's what transforms your family that's what changes your loved one that's indeed what makes you the man or the woman of God that the Lord can use so that when you lay your head on the sick when you lay and pray for them they shall recover hallelujah Hallelujah. He knew he had to suffer. He knew he had to go through it. That's how far he went. And he brought Peter, James, and John a little farther. 
and he himself went yet a little farther. That's literally, you check the Gospels, it literally says that he went a stone's throw farther into the depth of the garden to be on his face and to seek the Lord. What if the offering of your spike dart, the breaking of your alabaster box requires of you in this end time ministry to go a stone's throw a little farther into the things of the Spirit to give yourself just a stone's throw worthwhile of more of your effort and your energy to call on the name of the Lord to fast and to pray and to seek His face. What if that's all the distance that you are from your family breaking through? What if that's all the distance that you need to go in order for there to be revival in the Bible church? What if that's all the distance that it's going to require for you to get where God wants to take you and your transformation be complete? Just a little farther. Oh, yes. You'll have to endure some suffering, my brother or sister. But then consider yourself on the path because you're enduring a little suffering right now. And you want God to take it all away. When God is calling for Peter, James, and John, the Bible church, to come with him a little farther into the depth of the garden and of surrender. Oh, lift your hands and love the Lord. Lift your hands and love the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is looking for fruit. The precious fragrance of spikenard from the Bible church. You are on the cusp of breaking through the realms of the flesh and its control and hold over you. Oh, young people, you are so close to breaking forth into the ministry that God wants to use you that will affect and bless the young people all around you. You fathers and your mothers hallelujah grandpas and grandmas you are here because God still has souls for you to reach and the time is so short that we have got to give ourselves to the will of God in this end time hallelujah 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 and you cannot crucify yourself that's why these things are happening the way that they are. Oh, yes, you can say it's life. And oh, yes, you can say that it is your adversary that has come against you to bring these things to pass. But I say, nay, it is not your adversary. It is your father who is trying to break forth from your alabaster fleshly box, the spikenard, the preciousness of his Holy Spirit. You don't talk in tongues enough. You don't pray through enough. You don't pray through every day like you ought to pray. And you don't pray for others interceding, talking in tongues like you need to. The spikenard is locked up in this hard and fast container we call the flesh. It's only by some suffering. It's only by some struggle. It's only by some crushing can God get out of us what he's put in us that he wants to pour on this whole community. And you can't crucify yourself all of your desire to be used of God. It's like trying to crucify yourself. Oh, oh, you might, you might be able to find a cross and, and put one foot on top of another. And, and if you are that kind of Peter, gutsy individual, you might be able to drive a nail through both of your feet, holding you there on the cross. You might be able to use a hammer on your outstretched hand 
can drive the nail. But what about the other hand? What about the wound in your side where the blood is going to leak forth? Who's going to raise you up? You're going to need some help. And here's the strange part of the message, the ending portion of my, my lesson for us today. You can't crucify yourself, but you must needs be crucified so that the precious spike dart can come forth and bring healing and life-saving fragrance to those you love and that you care about. Oh, I know it's a little bit uncomfortable. I know you may ponder this for some days, but God wants you to understand you're going to need someone to crucify you. So the next time it seems that you're being persecuted, you need to realize that that's somebody helping you complete your mission. The next time it doesn't come together the way you like it and it's importune or it's uncomfortable even to the point of aching and crying and laying on your face. Somebody has become your Judas Iscariot to help you crucify and to die so that the Spirit of the Lord can leak forth and bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know that as far as I can tell, he, he only called Judas and he only called Simon Peter friend. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 49 and, and 50. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Judas came, he thought he was doing Jesus and the whole ministry thing a favor because this thing needs to get going. We need to speed this up. We're all going to be kings and priests with the Lord. Judas was a thief and a robber. He had the money bag. He embezzled funds. And he actually thought he was helping. Don't you know that those that try to nail you to your cross, they actually think that they are trying to help you? Verse 49, hallelujah. I don't know, did I give you that? You've got that scripture, Matthew chapter 24, or excuse me, 26, verse 49 and 50. Glory to God. Well, let's just do verse 50. That's good enough. Judas comes and Jesus says to him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? They were just waiting for Judas to show up and to kiss the one. They didn't even know who Jesus was. Can you imagine that? They couldn't recognize him on their own without somebody betraying him with a kiss. And Jesus calls the one that was going to betray him. He calls him friend. Friend. The next time you're being persecuted and someone's picking on you, they're just trying to help you get the spike nard out. They're just trying to help you. I'm going to close. You understand what I'm talking about. The Lord wants to transform our ministries, our relationships. That's why there's such a heaviness of the spirit here in this place. Because the Lord is trying to bring us to a place where we allow the crucifixion to take place in our lives, in our ministries, where we say, Abba, Father. Not my will, but thy will be done. Some of you are trying to make it all go away, and Jesus is trying to cause it to be completed so that what's in you leaks out on those who are lost all about you. Hallelujah. When Jesus said they would all stumble, and be offended. Remember, they didn't have the Holy Ghost. 
They were on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. They weren't baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Spirit. And yet, just at the beginning of the week, John chapter 12 and verse 24, Jesus told them when the Gentiles showed up looking for him, Jesus told his disciples, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Hallelujah. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Oh, Brother Clark, I want to live, I want to live, I want to enjoy the Lord. Oh, Brother Clark, I want to banquet and fellowship and dance and run the aisle. You say that, but how often when the opportunity presents itself, do you actually get up and run the aisle and dance and enjoy the presence of the Lord in this house? The truth is, unless you die, Unless a corn of wheat die, it abides alone. Some of you are just a stone's throw from fulfilling your ministry. A stone's throw from death taking place in your mortal life. And the precious spike nard of the spirit flowing out. What a powerful, powerful move of the Holy Ghost we've had today and I understand you've been having this for a little while now the spirit of the Lord moving while I'm sitting over there chomping at the bit to come prayerfully preach to you the Lord makes me to understand that he's desiring spike heart to flow your bendings your infirmities aching you're being broken so that God can pour out his spirit on those that you love and those that are around you. And if you can receive what I'm preaching this evening, tomorrow, the next few days as you surrender, surrender to the Lord's breaking, Someone's going to ask you, what's that new perfume I smell about you? What's that difference that I'm perceiving from you? I, I know you're a Christian, but you're not like the other ones that are here that we work with that claim to be, but they don't smell like you smell. They don't have the brokenness and the love for God that you are showing. What's different? about you. Would you stand? I know this message is for everybody, but in reality, the Lord is looking for Peter, James, and John, those that will come a little farther with him, those that are not like the other nine disciples, that upper 25%, shall we say, he called away to himself that heard his groanings. Would you bow your heads? They heard his groanings. Oh, yes. Three times Jesus came to them, but they had fallen asleep. But Peter told on himself. Peter put that in his account that Jesus came waking them up right before Judas came. I'm preaching this morning about end time alabaster boxes. End time vessels full of spike nerd. Men and women who feel the pressure, who hear the heartbeat of the coming and the calling of the Lord upon their ministry. If the Lord has been talking to you and 
you're not ashamed to show it, come to this altar. Come standing to this altar, head bowed. If you know that you've got to be truly broken so that the precious anointing of the ointment of the Spirit can flow out of you. Please hear me. I'm getting ready to close and leave this between you and God. Yes, we know that by His stripes we are healed. Yes, we know that we have been washed in His blood and we are sanctified by the Spirit and that if we believe, we'll lay heads on the sick and they shall recover. But the reality is, if the vessel is not broken, the precious anointing of spikenard cannot flow to those that need the touch in their bodies and who are waiting, depending, calling on you. Someone's got to feel it like our sister is feeling it. Someone's got to feel the touch of God, the surrender to God, like she is feeling it. The fact that you can hold it in and there are no tears that fall. There is no shaking of your shoulders. There's no surrender of your voice and crying out to him. That's an alabaster box that has yet to break. And somebody's got to break. Somebody's got to surrender. We are running out of time. We are running out of time. Oh, would you come? Ladies, would you sing? Would you let the Lord use your ministry to sing?